Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with John Herlocker of Tignus. We're going to talk today about using AI for fault detection in manufacturing. This is part of an ongoing series about AI in semiconductor manufacturing. John, how does fault detection and classification apply to what you're doing in, in semiconductor manufacturing? Thanks, Ed. Um, so fault detection classification is something that semiconductor manufacturing has been doing for some amount of time. You know, we like to call this classic FDC. And, um, but I think that, you know, particularly at, there's a huge opportunity here to be applying machine learning to greatly improve what you can get done from, you know, classic uh, compared to classic FDC. So I would say, you know, what, let's look at the limitations of classic FTC. So classic FTC is traditionally you're taking a sensor trace from a tool, you're putting sort of like bounds around it, and you're saying, hey, if it ever exceeds these bounds, I want to get notified, right? And in the past when they, you dealt with this, it was typically you got an RMA back and said, oh, this doesn't work. What do we do with this, right? It was, it was definitely sort of a reactive uh, situation, right? I mean, there was, you know, the limitations one is that it tended to be very reactive. It was, but, but my largely, I'd say the biggest limitation is it's highly manual. And because it's highly manual, it required a large amount of effort to set up. Uh, it required really smart people to get right. And it required, uh, and if your process or product changed at all, then you you had to kind of, it took a lot of manual effort to redo, right? And as a result, and, and then I guess finally the actual, and that's, a, that, that's sort of just looking at thresholds of something is a pretty limited way of looking at normality, right? And so it missed a lot of things. And so as a result, there's still a lot of scrap or yield issues that are being missed. And when you add in machine learning, the great advantage here is that it can process enormous amounts of data and detect patterns that you can't necessarily see very easily, right? That's correct, right? So I'd say, you know, the big, the big, there's multiple advantages moving from here to here. Say one is you're removing a lot of this manual effort, like identifying what is normal for something that can happen automatically. Also, and so when things change, you can just, it's much faster to reassess what's normal, et cetera. Uh, also, machine learning, the, we learned about function approximators. Well, machine learning can, you know, it can learn very complex functions, right? It can actually even start to, you know, emulate the physics of some of these tools in some ways. And as a result, it has the ability to be much more sophisticated in its ability to detect when something's not right. Uh, and I think the last piece of it has to do with predictiveness, right? And classic FTC, as you mentioned, is very reactive, right? You know, hey, this thing is out of whack, do something about it. If you have a predictive model of a system, you can also start to, you can move, detect things earlier. You can say, hey, things are starting to go bad before they actually do, much more predictive. So with the classic FTC, that was pretty much rules-based, right? You had to pick the right threshold. You had to do a lot of the ma manual data cleaning that you didn't have to do later on with the machine learning. Yeah, you're 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 exactly right. I think, and that's that's the manual part, right? Is that you had to, you had to have someone smart enough to know what are the right things to look at, what's the right thresholds, uh, and so when we talk to our customers, they have a lot of frustration about the FTC systems they set up because of just the number of humans they need to keep it working, right? As their product product evolves, particularly if you have a change in your product mix, but. The next step of this is still supervised, which is the, the big change here between the, the, the machine learning that you're talking about there and then the autonomous control, right? One goes from supervised to unsupervised? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that's an important subtlety to talk about. So in the last session on, uh, that we did on machine learning, we were talking primarily about supervised. Supervised is, I, uh, and so the, the short answer is both supervised and unsupervised are sort of different methods that can be helpful uh, for doing machine learning and fault detection. Supervised is applied when you have past examples of a fault, right? And you want to avoid repeating them in the future. That's a great use case for that. But, you know, we're finding in many of these cases, a lot of the sort of uh, faults that happen that cause major scrap events are things that have never happened before. So you can't use supervised learning to predict something you've never seen before. That's where the unsupervised comes in. And, you know, unsupervised is kind of this, this beautiful thing. Of, like, the basic idea is, is you, you probably remember, like, your normal distributions, right? It's like, okay, you know, you expect, you know, certain data to kind of have some normal distribution, right? And, you know, you're just not likely to see things kind of out here, right? And so sort of the whole concept of supervised is, 
you, you build a predictive model for something, and then you look at what's really happening, and if it kind of shows up way out here, then it's like, well, that's what we call anomalous, right? It's like we don't, it's very unlikely that we would have observed something like that in a healthy system, so something's wrong. So uh, anomaly detection is incredibly powerful in terms of allowing you to detect things you didn't even know could go wrong, right? But, you know, there's, you know, it's challenging to deploy properly because you can also get a lot of false positives. But the good news is, is that so the recent technology in this space, particularly some of the software that's, that's sort of optimized for the semiconductor space, is getting pretty good at dealing with those false positive situations. So just to put this in perspective, what you're really doing is getting a lot more granular with how you look at this data. Because some of the things may have shown up in the past and you may have missed them just because there's so much data to go through, right? That's right. But now you can see all this data. Now the challenge is, okay, which is the good data? What do we need to really focus in on versus what do we need to ignore? This, absolutely. Because you can decide you're going to use machine learning. And great. you know, And you can say you're going to decide you're going to use anomaly detection. Great. But you can't actually feed your entire, every sensor into the system. There's just too much data, even for the modern FTC systems. You have to have some idea about what signals are actually you know, predictive of, of bad outcomes. And, and that's where I think there's some exciting new technology on the market that will, you know, I guess classically what's happened is you collect all the sensor data and you just never look at it until something goes wrong and then you kind of maybe go look at it because you don't even know, you know, it's, some of these new tools have thousands of sensors traces coming out of them. How do you even know what's useful, right? Even the equipment owners don't even know what all that sensor data means in some cases. But the good news is there's some new sort of software on the on, on the space where, in some sense, AI just tirelessly shifts sifts through all this data, trying to sort of find you know which of these sensor traces actually seem to explain variability and outcomes that you care about, right? And so that has really helped along, F, you know, machine learning FDC in sort of recent iterations. That moves some of the challenge, though, out of the model itself, though, and into the data prep, right? So you really have to have really good data going into that uh, matrix that you're creating there. And you also need to then figure out, okay, how do we deploy and manage these models? Because you're all based upon the data that you've actually gotten very specific with. That's right. I mean, just a classic example of data prep, right? You might have, you know, a uh, wafer goes into a chamber and then, like, the, the gas flow starts, right? Well, usually these traces kind of look like, you know, maybe something like this, right? Where, you know, the wafer comes into the chamber here, but the gas flow doesn't start right away. Um, but the sensor feed's going, and then there's also maybe something on the end here. And the trouble is, is in order to really get a good signal, you kind of got to, you know, in many cases, filter out like this part and that part. And uh, today, a lot, you know, on classic FDC, it's often a human person who's literally like, oh, you know, defining where that is, right? And I think some of the new AI technology is pretty good at helping you sort of accelerate that data prep, right? Which is, this is the signal that matters, right? Um, so that's just kind of just an example of data prep. Uh, so building on this, really what you're looking at here is better model deployment and management, right? Because it, that's really where the focus becomes, because you have now all this data that you've managed to really hone in on and say, this, is the, this data is absolutely correct. Yeah, so right, after you have a, an expert who's identified what are the sensor traces or data feeds that are predictive, like once you've got that, and once you've got it cleaned, so it's all the dirt is out and the bad data is gone, um, you know, the, the next step is to build a model, but that's not really a hard problem, right? There's a lot of guys with data science, you know, uh, coursework who know how to like deploy them on the laptop and in their Jupyter notebooks. The real problem is getting that output into something that's running every day in production, taking real-time data, doesn't crash, right? All that kind of good stuff. Retrains if necessary. And I think that step is um, has been actually a major blocker, right? If you look at where most AI projects fail, they fail on the laptop of the data scientist and they don't make it to production. And so the good news is, is that uh, some of the more recent solutions that we're seeing on the market, uh, that are on the market for specifically designed for semiconductor manufacturing, have really reduced the friction to get that model to production. So it's no longer just about finding a fault or a defect, it's understanding the cause of that, right? 
Yeah, and so in some sense, that's kind of the classification side, right? And so it's kind of like a dirty secret is that most FDC systems don't do any C. Uh, they just do FD. Um, I think with, with machine learning, you can, you know, obviously there's two parts to machine learning in, in, in the predict FDC, applying machine learning to FDC. The first part is a user predictive model to either predict that the fault's going to happen because you've seen it before, right? Or to predict what's going to happen and see what actually happened was very different, right? Therefore, maybe there's an anomaly. The next step is trying to understand what what's going on there, right? So there's a lot of recent work in machine learning, learning around machine learning explainability. Well, why did you make that recommendation, right? And so it's still data driven. So it's not necessarily leveraging a deep knowledge of the physics of the underlying system, for example. But it at least can really point you in the right direction by saying, you know, you can ask it, why do you think there's a fault going on right now? And we can come back and say, well, because we see this huge surge in the voltage spike, you know, on that, you know, tool right here. And that's really unusual. Uh, and in many cases, that greatly accelerates the time to root cause. It doesn't necessarily tell you, hey, you need to replace your motor, right? But it dramatically reduces the amount of time it takes, you know, someone who does understand that tool to say, well, hey, that I shouldn't be seeing a voltage surge on that thing. That's a motor or that's a power supply problem. So does this actually turn into automated correlational analysis? Is that really where you're headed with this? Well, so, you know, I think the, the automated correlational analysis is uh, an example of like a capability that we at Tignus have offered our customers to help them discover, you know, like, why is this number vary? Like, why am I seeing a yield variation or why am I seeing a critical dimension variation, right? When I have, you know, millions of sensor data across, you know, hundreds of tools, you know, what, what's the cause of this, right? You know, so this automated correlational analysis helps sort of answer that question, as well as helping you identify which sensors to actually put into these predictive models in the first place. Thanks, John. The next episode in this series will be on virtual metrology. Yeah, so virtual metrology is a, a long dream of the semiconductor space. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking a bit about, you know, how machine learning in particular can uh, be applied to this concept of virtual metrology.